Uh, welcome, Jill Leovi, to The Glenn Show. How are you? Fine, thank you very much. Great. I'm really uh, pleased that you were able to give some time to uh, talk with me today uh, about your book, Ghetto Side, A True Story of Murder in America. Uh, you are, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I am, a, a reporter for the Los Angeles Times uh, that's newspaper. Right. Yes, and that's right. uh, your book covers uh, the homicide beat in um, in South L.A. And um, I... Uh, uh, read it uh, recently and was, you know, uh, very much taken by uh, by what I think is an important argument that's uh, just beautifully uh, uh, rendered and uh, takes us into a world that I don't think most uh, um, Americans would know very much about. Um, I wonder if we could get started by uh, you telling us a little bit about uh, about the book itself and about the genesis of the book and uh, what you're what you're 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 trying to do in in that piece of writing? <laughs> Too many things. That was a mistake I made with the book. It's uh it's trying to work in several arenas at once. Um, and and I'm I I mean you know I'm driving out of my lane a little bit in this book because it's not strictly journalism. I have an idea that had been bothering me for years that I got. Um, quite intrigued by in the research for the book about the nature of lawlessness and the way lawless uh, environments operate. Uh, and I and I try to cast the story of Genocide, which is a narrative, it's a story of a single murder, it's a story of a group of detectives. Uh, in I try to embed it in this context of, um, which I think is all important, of lawlessness or partial lawlessness to be more specific and what that is and what it does um so the book um as as you know it it traces the story of a single murder but um in the context of a very high murder rate among um blacks living in south los angeles and um some of the impediments and frustrations that detectives run up against when they try to invest these case, investigate these cases, and um, and uh, I guess I'm not very good at describing. <laughs> oh well, I think uh, the book speaks for itself at a certain level. If we just talk about it, uh, the um, force of what you've produced there will come across. Um, uh, but let me just pick up on this first point that you mentioned. Uh, you're being intrigued by the implications of, of law, what you're calling lawlessness. Uh, this, I am presuming, is a reference to the fact that so many of the homicides end up never ha uh, never being solved. That so many of the uh, killing killers are uh, operating with a kind of impunity. Impunity, exactly. And impunity the implications is of very that. interesting. It's interesting. It, How so? It, How so? It, it, well, this is, I mean, this is why, and I, I, I appreciate what you do. I think to have the voice of a pundit is a unique voice, but I'm not so interested in the punditry. I'm very, very interested in this. And, and I want to talk to you, um, as somebody who knows nothing about economics. So forgive me. I, I'm completely unschooled, but I want to suggest to you that there is an economy of violence or, or rather an economy of violent power that operates uh, really at every level of individual and communitarian violence from war to civil war to sectarian to communal violence all the way down to interpersonal violence. That there are material dynamics, if you will, that determine what happens in these kinds of settings and they're quite predictable and they're quite uniform across uh, human populations. And I. The way I imagine it, and again, you can tell me that I'm all wrong, you know, something goes on with you economists. It has to do with maximizing efficiencies and deltas this and deltas that. I, in <laughs> some way, what I'm suggesting is that instead of dealing with uh, resource allocation and maximizing efficiency, if you were to sub in violence and violent power, um, you would be able to create almost a mathematics 
of lawless environments. It's, I, I know that sounds kind of wacky, but it's... Oh, no, 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 no. Let me just interrupt you for a moment here as the resident economist in this conversation. Um, I think you may have a, uh, you know, somewhat uh, narrow view of what, what economics makes possible, if not it's always rendered in practice, which is uh, very much, I think, sympathetic to this uh, idea that you're pushing about how um, uh, the, the consequences of insecurity kind of undermine, you know, the, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm becoming incoherent here myself. Here's what I mean to say, uh, that there's a kind of um, unraveling uh, that takes place when people know that they can kill with impunity, when other people know that people who kill can kill with impunity and killing, killing them. When witnesses... Uh, uh, there's a death spiral kind of thing that goes on here, and and the it's it's kind of a, an ironic right, but it's uh, not word. chaos. It's not. Uh, it's oh, there's not a logic to it. This is what I'm sorry. Excuse yes. me for interrupting. I just want to say, economists. I don't know if you've ever read anything that Thomas Schelling, uh, the great economist. Uh, he's he's an elderly man now, a Nobel laureate. But his great book about uh, the standoff, the nuclear standoff between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, other such matters, he calls it uh, the strategy of conflict. Uh, but but Tom uh, would be would have been all over uh, this uh, case study of yours as an exemplary uh, illustration of um, the uh, the tragic uh, consequences of uh, of people being able to, of the state not maintaining a, le a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. Right, uh, so because if witnesses don't come forth, you can't convict people. But if you can't convict people, witnesses are not going to come forth, and that ends up being an equilibrium. This kind of thing. It is well, it's, it's an equilibrium, but there's more to it than that. There's and and what it's you're saying, I haven't read the writer you talk about, but there I think there's a term I've seen scholars use: security dilemmas. Yeah. Where it's, um, and this is, you, don't freak out, <laughs> but this is what I've been thinking about lately. I think that what you see in these environments, South Central LA, and by the way, this is the thing that just gripped me researching the books. It's all the same. Northern Ireland, South Africa, some of these uh, South American cities, Central America, even hunter-gatherer uh, uh societies in some cases. You, you, you see it in um, tribal lands. Uh, the, the, the elements of the homicide enclave are always the same. And I think that, um, that part of what you're seeing in that disorderly order, if you will, is actually um, adaptations to minimize violence. Doesn't that sound crazy? Uh, the idea is that it would be much worse if people were not grouping together, if they were not using retaliation, for example, as a regulatory device, which is, I, I think, part of how retaliation functions. It sounds like I'm out of my mind because if I'm talking about environments where, where homicide death rates are, you know, 40 per 100,000 population per year or higher. These are very, very high homicide rates. But there's a reason why they're not 500. Uh, they could actually be higher. I think that some of what you see in these environments, for example, um, the uh, the elaborateness of message sending, which is a huge part of what I think people misidentify as the culture of the ghetto, the idea that you always have to be broadcasting messages. Arson is, is classic. Arson is the great message sending crime of lawless enclaves, but also just, you know, walking and talking in a tough way. Um, lots of very kind of elaborate uh, rituals around insults and, um, and slights and snubs that tell people who's in power, who's not, whether you're on the ins or the outs with the local grouping of young men who's probably regulating their neighborhood. Are they giving you hard stares? Are they not giving you hard stares? Uh, there's a scene in Ghetto Side where um, very, very common crimes, scores and scores of these in LA a year, the Molotov cocktail through the front plate gla glass window of the house. Um, that is uh, understood by all sides in the situation I described as a message. It's telling you 
one set of rules apply that now another doesn't apply. Well, why send messages? What is the point of messages? Um, messages are what you do before uh, you let yeah. things rise to the level of violence. This is, yeah. and these are systems in place to, um, to, to kind of, so that you don't have to go straight to violence every time, if you see what I mean. I'm not articulating myself very well, but, but well, uh, there's a, there's a, a hierarchical ladder of steps that build up to, to violence. Intimidation, uh, is just very, very well developed. It's almost a language. I just want to pick up on a couple of things, Jill, and, and to underscore that you're saying here, I think they're very important. Um, and I, I do want to say, I repeat, they're not at all strange to the ear of, uh, of the modern economists who should be familiar with these kind of arguments. Um, I never get to talk to economists, so it's very exciting for me. This is, I'm very lonely <laughs> with this stuff. <laughs> uh, or, or good sociologists either, uh, for that matter. Um, I'm thinking about a book, an old book by a man named Sykes. Uh, uh, about prisons, um, society of captives. Uh, it, it's not ghetto hom homicide. This is about what goes on in the uh, relative lawlessness inside of, uh, of institutions. But a world gets created, order gets somehow realized, created or achieved, if you will. Various uh, roles, routines, mechanisms, practices, and so forth evolve and come into play. And they are rational and logical, even though from to the outside eye, they, they would look, they would look that bizarre. That is exactly right. That is exactly right. And and so some of what, um, and and here I'm going to engage your pundit side a little. Some of what's called cultural to me is is, is are these material conditions. One of the things that is, um, I, I think actually kind of heartbreaking about black on black homicide is yes, it's petty as all get out, right? It is so petty. People killing each other over five dollars. People killing each other over some stupid spat with their over a girl or over a stolen pair of tennis shoes. I mean, you, you just you, you, the police are speechless in the face of this because it seems so perverse, right? So petty. And uh, w what's lost there is that you know what? It's always petty. It is always if you have high homicide rates. Most of the homicides in any culture and any place in the world, you can go back in time, they will always be petty. I had a quote I didn't use in the book, actually from Thucydides, where he describes this in the Peloponnesian War. It's, uh, I think this is a Corsarian Revolution. There's uh, great civil disruption. There's um, lawlessness in the streets. And instantly you see this outbreak of petty fighting over debts, over jealousy, over all kinds of small disputes. Uh, you know, we in uh, America talk about our ghettos as as having a perverse culture, as if, you know, 30 million people suddenly decided to be real touchy for no reason. Uh, but when, for example, Baghdad in 2005 is swept by a wave of personal violence and vendetta violence, we don't assume that those people change cultures overnight. What's changed is is the price of violence. When it's it's the what you, it's not that you have the conflict. It's how the conflicts are resolved, and how expensive it is to use this very very effective way of resolving okay. disputes. How expensive it is to use violence to um, to adjudicate those uh, disputes. So what you what you see is is the price of violence is going to affect how much it's used. I think an economist can understand yeah, that. Yeah, although right? there's a bit of a metaphor with respect to price, but I get what you mean. If it's, I mean, it's it's a number of different things, I suppose. I mean, one of the things it is is the direct incentive calculation. What's my chance of getting caught and being punished? If that number is low, the price of violence is low, you'll get more violence. Yes, being caught. But there, it seems to be there's much more going on in what you're saying. So preemptive violence. Um, you know, I engage yes, in violence now violence. so that I don't have to engage in more violence later. Uh, vi violence in the oh, service yeah. of maintaining a reputation for toughness. Um, it appears that I have a hair trigger sensibility, but actually what I'm doing is signaling to every tough guy in the room that if you F with me, you're going to have a problem. And I do that. I seize upon that's the right, opportunity that, to that do that. Reputation. You know? Right. That reputation has material value. It is a you you can measure it in safety units. And I hear that all the time, you know, covering uh, these homicides. If I had a dollar for every homicide detective 
who says to me, if the victim had been more street, he would have survived, or he was with his buddies and they were more street, and he was the one who wasn't, and that's why he didn't survive, or he got into this argument he was in over his head, he got into this neighborhood he was in over his head. We think of these tough guy adaptations as being entirely perverse and destructive, but in this environment, they can save your life. And it actually happened uh, in Ghetto Side, just accidentally, in a couple of those homicides. What you see is that, you know, the least gang-involved person becomes the victim because they're not quick enough. They don't read the signs. They don't understand the language in the same way that the people around them do. Those adaptations are survival in yeah. that environment. Now, I, I want to push on another, not push against, but push in the direction that you're indicating, another dimension of what you've just said, which is this uh, evocation of cultural accounts, which is very commonsensical. You know, I'm sitting outside of this environment. I'm reading my newspaper, watching my television. I see these horrific things. Kid shot over a pair of sneakers. Kid shot because somebody dissed his girlfriend. Kid shot because he was wearing his hat the wrong way, had the wrong color, handkerchief in his pocket, whatever, whatever. You say it's petty. Yes, it's petty. And my thought sitting there, uh, uh, Mr. Everyman, is what manner of pathological deprivation of moral sensibility produces such a disregard for human life? Who are these people? Now, now, you, now you're saying, right, exactly, you're saying, exactly. and I, I just want to make this explicit, and if I get it wrong, please tell me. You're saying, no, 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 fight the instinct to make that judgment. If you and your kin were placed in the same structural situation with the same ongoing dynamics, you probably behaving in the same way. Uh, it's amazing, but true. And you see it happen. Uh, what, what's, what's a really interesting tell here is you see societies change overnight. Um, you see them go from being, I used in my Wall Street Journal uh, piece, the example of Egypt, which used to be an astonishingly low homicide country and became high homicide overnight after the 2011 Arab Spring. And to the point that you had communal justice, you had people being strung yeah. from lampposts. Uh, corpses, I think, in that case. Uh, nobody talks about culture or rap music or whatever in those situations. It's clear what's going on. So, so listen, I want to ask you something, uh, and, and I'm going to be, it's a pointed question. You, you say the environment, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but this is what I'm hearing from you, that the environment of um, lawlessness uh, has its own logic and that much of what seems pathological when viewed from the outside uh, is really the uh, the natural endpoint of people's uh, reaction to the circumstances which they find themselves. So the question is, um, by your own account, the uh, neighborhood in which this uh, homicide uh, that you're reporting on is playing itself out is uh, mostly uh, Mexican American, and uh, they have nothing like the level of uh, fratricidal. Uh, violence uh, going on amongst them. Indeed, they're uh, disproportionately victimized. Uh, by these crimes perpetrated by African-Americans who are living in the same general environment. How is it that these logical forces end up playing themselves out amongst blacks in a scale of fratricidal homicide that dwarfs that of another non-white minority living in exactly the same physical location? Uh, I know this makes sense. The uh, Latinos in L.A. are close to as poor. You know, I think it's pretty close. Um, the family issues are, are different, but I have to say that you see single motherhood increasing, I believe, among Latinos in L.A. at quite a hmm. rapid rate. Uh, and uh, they're living in the same places. There are There's massive gang involvement among Latinos. They are uh, also involved in the drug, street drug trade. So the differences we see in their rates are, um, I'm back. <laughs> Sorry about that. The differences that you see in their uh, rates are, to, to, to me, I, in some way, reason, in some way, I think this is um, this is what um, got my foot hooked in this whole trap <laughs> ten years ago that I've spent ten years chewing my leg off to get out, <laughs> which is what it's like to write a book. Uh, I just couldn't understand that. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand it. And um, what I've what I've come to is, well, you have to think about the differences between. Blacks and Latinos, they're very, very different. The histories are very, very distinct, of course, right? Um, and the situation is distinct. One of the big 
uh, differences in situation is segregation. I actually think residential seg segregation is hugely, hugely important. It's an abetting condition for homicide. You can't have uh, the homicide enclave without this certain geographic space and separateness and enclave nature of the population. And, um, you know, I use Douglas Massey a lot in my book. You, you just can't beat blacks for that. Their situation uh, with residential housing segregation is different than groups of immigrant extraction in the U.S. And you definitely see that in Los Angeles. What, L.A. County and L.A. City and California is rapidly becoming a majority Latino place. Latinos are everywhere uh, and spread all around. Blacks are not. They have this multi-generational concentration and, and isolation. Uh, in terms of segregation, that well, let that's me before you go to another point. Okay, segregation. That. I just want to make sure I'm understanding. You're saying, are you that uh, whereas you know there are many neighborhoods that a modest income Mexican family can elect to live in, uh, and uh, they can move from this one to that. They're not the uh, African Americans by virtue of being so concentrated geographically. It's like festering one on top of the other, and it's hard to escape these networks of interpersonal relationships. That's right. They're extremely networked, as you pointed out. And this is this is one of the things that bothers me about the way people talk about these issues. The, just the phrase black yeah. community uh, draws a reaction from me a little. This is a problem of, you know, commutarian violence. It is a it is a problem of communal justice, in a sense. OK. Um, hi, we're back. This is Glenn Lowry at The Glenn Show with uh, Joe Leovi. Uh, writer, reporter for the New York, uh, Los Angeles Times, I beg your pardon, um, discussing her book, Ghetto Side, A True Story of Murder in America. And um, we were down into the details about the relationships between police uh, who investigate homicide cases and uh, the witnesses uh, whom they rely on to bring those cases to fruition, the families with whom they, um, whom they must console and with whom they work in the course of uh, developing their cases and uh, talking about the relationship between um, the homicide detectives who have a very specialized uh, beat in terms of police work um, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the uniform detectives who are pulling people over for traffic violations and uh, chasing down people um, who might be burglars or robbers and things like that. The homicide detectives, depending very much on the cooperation of the community to be able to bring their cases to fruition. But as we all know, the tensions between police and communities of color in cities around the country, including Los Angeles, are uh, fraught and uh, the tensions are high. Relations not necessarily altogether healthy. And I just want to hear your thoughts, Jill, on the relationship between these two dimensions of policing, how they interact with each other, uh, the extent to which they are uh, mutually reinforcing or to some degree getting in each other's way and uh, what what might be done about that. Well, it's a, that's very interesting. Of course, when you're inside these workplaces, they're like all workplaces. We have very equivalent situations within the LA Times newsroom. There are, <laughs> uh, there are camps, there are rivalries, there are different kinds of workers who uh, sometimes don't like each other, um, and uh, sometimes cooperation, sometimes not. You see that I, I had many homicide detectives say to me things to the effect of, you know, so-and-so's really a traffic cop. He likes to do traffic stops all day. I can't imagine doing that. What a tedious, awful job that would be. <laughs> Why are those guys interested in impounding cars of immigrants who don't have licenses? I mean, there's there's a lot of kind of very different views within policing of um, what's worthy and what isn't. Uh, who's worthy and what isn't, and, and who isn't. Um, you know, it's very interesting. A department psychologist, LAPD department psychologist, once told me that surprisingly, and it's very important, I actually think, that homicide detectives tend to be among the most psychologically healthy of cops, even though they are working with this terrible subject matter in these tragic situations. And she said that she thought the reason was that they actually have something to do that they can accomplish and see it through. They're there for a reason. There's a very specific goal. Now, you're saying you're saying here homicide detectives, perhaps ironically, 
are psychologically healthier within the policing uh, profession, which is known for being uh, uh, bedeviled by psychological problems in their uh, workers, police, police officers. Uh, in part because there's a discrete task at hand that they can see all the way through to the end. And even if they don't solve every case, they solve some cases. Whereas if you're a beat cop out there, you know, inveighing against criminality in general, you're probably, uh, you know, uh, depressed and uh, pessimistic and uh, negative because it just seems to be an unending flow of uh, human misery. In my own reporting in South LA, I, it used to be that when you asked for a ride along with officers, you could only go with supervisor. I had a very sympathetic uh, deputy chief who put me in cars with ordinary officers for a while. And uh, just a little bit of that experience was, uh, it was so perspective changing. It is a very tough job. And most of what officers deal with hour after hour is so futile they can't fix it yeah it's this glancing kind of um encounters with people in terrible pain and misery uh, you're really dealing with people at the very margins of society homeless people people trapped in domestic violence uh, situations um you know people with hard to define kinds of illnesses and mental illnesses. It is it, the hopelessness and pain is overwhelming if you let it in, in that kind of situation. You have to be uh, all about business. You have to be able to uh, dodge in and dodge out of it really quickly. Uh, the homicide detectives um, do form these long-term relationships. They do form sort of, I think, a richer view of what's going on with people because of the nature of their interactions with them. And like you say, they have a discreet job to do and they can accomplish it. Uh, I think that um, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of, you know, we, we've been talking a lot in this country about bad policing. My own observation is that mediocre policing <laughs> is, a very, is a big problem. Uh, there are some very good police officers, patrol officers that you meet sometimes who want to do good. And what you hear from them is um, that they find it hard to know how to do that with the duties that they're given, that they can't really figure out how to not be on a treadmill that uh, is just leading from one futility to another. They're very tough jobs. Other workers in um in what you might call the ghetto side setting, suffer the same thing. I am. Um, I don't know. It's, it's probably not a good. I, I once went with a patrol officer who picked up a homeless man who was causing some kind of problem. They took him to the 72-hour um, mental illness uh, facility lockup, and uh, and when we got to the counter there at Augustus Hawkins, uh, the nurse said, "Oh, we know him. We've had this same man." 17 times it was his 17th wow. visit to this facility and then of course he goes back out on the streets and and if i could just just the look on everybody's face wow. i mean it, it's almost like exasperation is a is the, the default position that keeps you sane it's hard um it's hard to put your heart out of yourself in every encounter like that in a job like that well, so uh, I think that's important. If you, I think police officers need purpose, uh, just like they need to be very well paid. I'm sorry, they, they need well what? Trained. Police officers need what? I didn't hear. They need meaning and purpose okay, in their purpose. work. <laughs> it is a prophylactic against corruption. It is uh, something that keeps them uh, on the straight and narrow and, and, and affects how they do their jobs if they feel like they have purpose in their work. It is... Um, in my own experience, Glenn, quite psychologically overwhelming to be immersed in death, for example. Um, it can really do things to you if you don't have a very, very clear idea of why you're there and what you're trying to do. Uh, and I think we don't talk about these issues a lot with, uh, with policing in um, very poor neighborhoods. They, they're just uh, up to their ears and suffering, and it's hard to handle. Well, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Forgive me for an editorial comment here, but I can't help but think that the contemporary uh, uh, discussion, especially on the left, about the police uh, minority community relations is insufficiently attentive to this to this point, this point about um, the uh, here we are as a society 
we have broken people and, and, and we have people whose development has been impaired and, and uh, who have suffered uh, all manner of um, miseducation, um, uh, inherited despair from their economic desperation, um, our, bad luck. Uh, yeah, bad luck, uh, disease, uh, unattended, uh, addiction, uh, depression, and so on. And, and, and as you point out, they're, they're concentrated in geographic districts. And then we send the police in to deal with that, to keep us safe from it, to, to clean it up, to control it, to manage it. And uh, the people who do that work, who are in that position uh, as police officers, are scarred and themselves diminished by the task that we've put uh, upon them. Um, and then now that we have a narrative, we, we're coming into uh, uh, you know a time of reform, people think, a movement to bring that about. Um, but we don't see, I mean, it's almost like you know exploitation of workers. We have workers, they go down into the coal mine, they, they dig the coal, they breathe the bad air, uh, and then we sit comfortably with our homes heated by the coal that we buy at a relatively cheap price. Uh, uh, don't we owe a decent uh, living, a decent wage, occupational safety, and respect for what they do to the coal miner? Yes, we do. Do we not also owe, in similar uh, spirit, uh, a kind of sympathetic regard uh, and a presumption of, uh, of respect and, and, and gratitude, uh, I almost want to say? Not with my eyes rolling back in my head as some kind of romantic, you know, oh, police officer, this and that. I know that they're bad cops. There are plenty of bad cops out there. But um, this is essentially an impossible job uh, that people are doing, uh, and um, uh, well, we don't know what the enemies. Is. I want to say that they're not the. They're not the. Okay, anyway, I'm done. That's my editorial. Yeah, I mean, they, 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 first of all, I want to tell you that I, I am, I'm sure there's a great deal of very, very bad and, and even abusive policing going on around the country, and it's easy to be outside of that and complacent about that when you're when you're the one who has to be scared for your skin in that situation it's a very different thing one of the uh one of the things you need to understand about policing in the united states is extremely fragmented it's very it's, it's highly variable we have uh we have our highest crimes think about this investigated by municipal police departments you know, our lowest order of local government yeah. uh, practices very widely. I was um, actually talking to uh, Wally Tanelli yesterday, and he was talking about to the LAPD officer, one of the things that stands out in a lot of these incidents around the country is cops working alone, which, of course, is cheap. In L.A., all cops work in pairs, yeah. and it changes how they react to situations. It, it, it doubles your expense. For patrol, yeah. but um, most LAPD cops view that as a basic safety and security measure for both themselves and the people they're dealing with. So uh, I'll give you one more example: the Baltimore thing. You know, LAPD uh, dealt with paddy wagons in the 70s, and I think finally got rid of them as a result of some court decisions in maybe the late 70s or early 80s. So you're talking about a 30, you know, 35 year a divergence in practice between police departments in the, around the country in the same country. Police departments are very different and very different things are happening. And I find it quite a, uh, easy to believe that there's some very shabby policing um, going on around the country. And, and, and I would also push back a little. I used to tease the officers that I was with. I was like, they, they were always having uh, officer Appreciation Day back behind 77th and people would bring out the Barbie. I was like, where's the Reporter Appreciation Day? <laughs> uh, they're, 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 the cops, I think, are sometimes much too invested in the idea of being do-gooders and being heroes and they get sulky about firefighters who are um, you know, more often heroes and possibly more good-looking than they are. <laughs> and, uh, and you want to tell them to just do their job.